We have the Missouri Attorney General. Uh, he is demanding a couple of things. Uh, first of all, that the Department of Justice turn over the documents related to several of President Trump's prosecutions as the prosecutions appear to be part of a coordinated effort by the DOJ that involved the White House. Uh, Andrew Bailey, the uh, the Attorney General, is with us now. Uh, Andrew, how are you, sir? Doing well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Uh, thank you. You are one of the really good AGs in the country, and I, I have to tell you, it is the first of the last of the line are the AGs, and if you guys go dark, it's up to the sheriffs. And I'd, li- I'd like to not get to the sheriff part, so thank you <laughs> well, for everything it. you're doing. Um, well, tell me ab- tell me about what you're looking for from the Department of Justice, why you're looking for it, and what the response has been so far. Well, and Glenn, I appreciate you covering this story extensively. Everyone can see the illicit witch hunt prosecutions that are going on from yes. Alvin Bragg's office, from Fonnie Williams' office, from Letitia James's office, and from the Biden's crooked Department of Justice. But and we, and we of- know already, do we not know for a fact um, that there are ties directly to the White House, that they're, they're, right. they're coordinating. It, yeah, they are absolutely coordinating. The Biden Department of Justice has become the nerve center for a coordinated uh, witch hunt prosecution of a political opponent. And it's not designed to obtain a legally valid conviction. It's designed to take anyone running against Joe Biden, in other words, President Donald Trump, off the campaign trail. How do we know this? Because they've deployed resources in the fight at the state level. That's illicit collusion. And I'm talking about Matthew Colangelo. This was the number three ranking official at Biden's crooked Department of Justice, a longtime DNC activist with deep ties to the Democratic Party, who has now taken a job with Alvin Bragg's office and is leading the prosecution in the courtroom in Manhattan at the state level against President Donald Trump. That is sufficient evidence to disqualify these prosecutors, and we demand records. We need to have transparency. I think they have enormous liability on their professional licensure, civil liability, and potential, potentially criminal liability. I mean, at some point, we need to talk about prosecuting the prosecutors. Thank you. Um, so, um, may I just call you Andrew? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, General. sir, please. Okay, so, so Andrew, um, how um, unusual is it for that kind of a uh, a transfer of job, I mean, does that happen? Is this just our speculation? Yeah, it, well, in isolation, it wouldn't be a problem in and of itself. The problem comes from the illicit motivations that can be imputed to these prosecutors. So let's talk about Alvin Bragg for a second, which, by the way, I love that his website and his motto for his office is one standard of justice for all. I mean, how does this guy keep a straight face while saying that? But this is an individual who worked for Letitia James, who campaigned on a promise to prosecute Donald Trump, who has been involved in civil litigation against Donald Trump when he worked at the New York Attorney General's office. There is no way a court in Missouri would allow him to prosecute that criminal case, even if even if there was a criminal case, which I don't concede that there is. It's not supported by the facts or the law. And we've covered you've covered that extensively. We've talked about that nauseum, but the illicit motivation of the prosecutors is self-evident by the previous behavior and statements that Alvin Bragg has made. Same with Matthew Colangelo. I mean, the, the DOJ cases against President Donald Trump are also equally specious in nature. In other words, not supported by the facts of the law. So Joe Biden keeps documents in his garage where anybody can get to him and oh he's too old to know what he's doing so let's let him off the hook despite the fact that somehow he's the chief executive of the united states of america but we're going to go after president donald trump who had the authority to declassify the very documents he was in possession of that were in a safe so again you've got matthew colangelo leading all of that and now going to help alvin bragg that is wow. an appearance of impropriety at a minimum and i believe there's actual impropriety substantive impropriety the political motivation of the prosecutors is sufficient to call into question their judgment in these cases. Couple that with the fact that they brought baseless charges not supported by the facts of the law, and it will undermine the credibility of whatever illegal conviction they ultimately obtain. So tell me what cases you're looking at. You're looking at Alvin Bragg, uh, and you're looking at, um, uh, shoot, what was the uh, other one? Patricia James, Bonnie Willis. Yeah. Yeah, yes. All of them. All, all of them. Of them. Well, 
Yeah, there's a documented history of this, too. This isn't just some conspiracy theory. I mean, your listeners will recall in 2016 how the DOJ deep state uh, conspired to perpetrate the Russian collusion hoax against President Trump to undermine his presidency before he took office. And think about those text messages between Lisa Page and Peter Strzok. You're telling me that isn't going on between Letitia James, Alvin Bragg, Matthew Colangelo. Bonnie will I mean, the, the whole crew. And so, so we know it, this evidence is out there, and it needs to be transparent from the public. So is there a statute of limitations on any of these? You know, it depends on what facts are uncovered, but I don't think that we're, I don't think we're in any risk of losing the ability to hold the wrongdoers accountable. And again, that can take many different forms. First and foremost, we need to expose this so the public understands what's going on here. It was never about an actual criminal case against President Trump. It was always about getting him off the campaign trail. Now, once that is established, which again, circumstantial evidence gives rise to the reasonable inference today. But when we're in possession of the documents that we believe will reveal an actual substantive impropriety, then we start talking about censure against professional licensure. We start talking about President Trump having a civil suit for violation of his civil rights. And if crimes were committed, then absolutely criminal prosecution should be on the table. For far too long, conservatives have allowed this lawfare to go on. And it has gotten worse and worse and worse to where now Missourians are being denied access to their their chosen political uh, candidate, their chosen presidential candidate, President Donald Trump. So, you know, lawfare is the wave of the future. I mean, if President Trump wins, uh, they're going to make what happened on January 6th, I think, look like, uh, you know, a a walk in the park. And they're lawyering up like crazy. Lawfare is, is the future. How do we turn that around? Well, it's tough because as conservatives, we believe in the rule of law. We believe that... The text, history, and tradition of the Constitution still mean something, and that we elevate the rules of the game above the players and the outcomes. And so the only way to serve those rule of law principles but also fight back against lawfare is to hold those perpetrating lawfare accountable. And that's what I seek to do in this instance. Now, uh, how likely are we to get these, you know, documents? Well, I'm not going to be stonewalled by Biden's crooked Department of Justice. They may play those games in the courts in the state of New York, which, by the way, you know, shame on the judiciary in the state of New York for not disqualifying these prosecutors and from, you know, allowing these uh, appearances of impropriety to, to perpetrate even from the bench in this illicit witch hunt prosecution. But at the end of the day, this would never stand in Missouri. We're not going to be stonewalled by the Department of Justice. They have a responsibility for transparency, especially given the heightened sensitivity around a presidential election. And so these are serious allegations. They need to live up to their obligations under the Freedom of Information Act. And we're going to shine the light of truth on this as soon as practical. And when we had the, uh, the document case, when they turned over the uh, documents, we found collusion, did we not? That's absolutely true. Again, this is a documented pattern of behavior that extends far beyond the current presidential election cycle. It goes all the way back to 2016. Unbelievable. Um, can I, let me switch uh, subjects. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs, which, uh, full disclosure, my family and I, we root for the Kansas City Chiefs all the time. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, love the Hunt family and everything else. What, what happened there uh, is is such an attack on, honestly, freedom of expression for your religion. He's speaking, I mean, the left always says, keep it in the, you can keep it in your house of worship. Well, that was a religious university, and he got a standing ovation. Nobody seemed to really be um, uh, offended by it, and they have gone after him and doxed him. What are you doing? Well, look, we're not going to let city officials in Kansas City who doxed Harrison Bucker in retaliation for his free expression of his faith, of his religious beliefs, we're not going to let them violate the Missouri Human Rights Act that it exists in order to prohibit that kind of discriminatory behavior. And you're right. I mean, if anybody has watched the commencement address itself, I would commit it for everybody to view yeah. it. It's a fabulous speech. And you know what he says at the beginning? You know what Harrison Bucker says? He says the left wants to drive free expression of Christian beliefs from public discourse. And that's exactly what's happening. Yes. I mean, that's what the left is doing to Harrison Butker. Now, the problem from a state law perspective is when the city of Kansas City, using an official Twitter account, publishes 
Harrison Bucker's residence. Why did they do that? In retaliation. The government can't retaliate against someone for the free expression of their faith. And that's what's going on here. And suddenly, I'm the bad guy. Quentin Lucas, the mayor of Kansas City, within the last 72 hours, has fired off an incendiary letter to me, accusing me of fanning the, the flames of, of racial discord. Like, what? Wow. That has nothing to do with it. You know you're doing the right thing when the left baselessly pay, plays the race card. So somehow, my enforcement of the statute intended to prevent discrimination is discriminatory to the, the mayor of Kansas City. Makes zero sense. That's when you know you're doing the right thing. We're going to fight for all Christians or any, any faith community's ability to have free expression of their religious belief protected by the Constitution and the laws of the state of Missouri. And what are you going for on that, Andrew? We have demanded accountability and transparency there, too. We've demanded documents about who manages the social media account, who has access to it, why this post was uh, tweeted out when it was. Uh, we need to make sure that there's guardrails in place to ensure that, the again, the government resources aren't being weaponized to push a radical, progressive, discriminatory agenda in violation of state law. And if we have to, we'll go to court and get an injunction to put a stop to it. Andrew Bailey, the uh, Attorney General of Missouri. Always good to talk to you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you having me on. You bet. If you didn't hear Bill Maher's comments on uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Kansas City Chiefs kicker's comments, listen to what he said. Here's cut two. I couldn't be more not like this guy. The close- He's in big trouble because he said at this event, and this is a Catholic college, conservative Catholics, and they, they, he's now history's greatest monster. Uh, again, I don't agree with much with this guy, but I don't get the thing. He said, uh, some of you, talking to this, the women here, some of you may go on to lead successful careers in the world. Okay, that seems fairly, like, modern. But I would venture to guess that the majority of you are most excited about your marriage and the children you will bring into this world. I don't see what the big crime is. I really don't. And I think this is part of the problem people have with the left, is that lots of people in this country are like this. Like he's saying, some of you may go on to lead successful careers, but a lot of you are excited about this other way that people, everybody used to be. And now, can it, can't that just be a choice, too? And I feel like they feel very put upon, like there's only one way to be a good person. And that's to get an advanced degree from one of those asshole factories like Harvard. <laughs> I find it very, very ironic that he's, he's saying, you know what, you, in my world, you know, uh, we like the women to stay at home and just have babies. And the college kids and the young people find this absolutely abhorrent. But they're demonstrating for Hamas. Right. Who make that a law. It's not just an opinion in Hamas that you stay home and have the babies. We will enforce you for doing that. Okay, I just wanted to make that point. I, I, I have to tell you, I think Bill Maher has become, and I don't agree with him on a lot of stuff, he is becoming my favorite liberal because he's an actual classic liberal once again. He's somebody who is just saying, freedom of speech, man. Say what you want. Don't force everybody else. Thank you, Bill Maher.